Good evening, everyone. It is such an honor to be here in this shul. I have heard so much about the shul, and I want to express my deepest appreciations to the rabbi for such a kind introduction and for opening up your shul to me. And of course, I want to thank my parents, Alan and Norman Goldstein, who are here today, who are my mentors and my rock, my titanium net, who have taught me everything and are the reason why I have the values I have that I hope to transmit to my children. And of course, my dearest friend, Esther, who has gone above and beyond and worked so hard to make this happen. Thank you so much for organizing this event for me. I'm very grateful to you. Excuse me. People have started comparing, or when October the 7th actually happened, the comparison was immediate. They started comparing what happened in Israel to what happened in the United States on 9-11, and they said that it's, it's similar. And I agree with them to a certain extent. On the one hand, each of our countries experienced a very devastating tragedy. Americans were terrorized on 9-11, and of course, October the 7th, left the Jewish world traumatized and shocked at the horrific massacres. Although I do want to point out that the scale of the death toll on October the 7th is 15 times higher than what happened in America on 9-11. Another similarity between 9-11 and October the 7th is that the world woke up to the threat of radical Islam in a way that they were not paying attention before. Nobody before 9-11 was talking about radical Islam. Nobody was talking about jihad. 9-11 obviously changed that. But not too soon after 9-11, all that talk seemed to die down. The counterterrorism personnel who were warning about radicalization on our campuses were not being listened to. The forensic accountants who have been warning about Qatari money flowing unhindered into American educational institutions were dismissed as alarmists. The moderate Muslims and the politicians who have been screaming at the top of their lungs about the threat of radical Islam within our borders were marginalized as radical, as extreme, as anti-Muslim. And a new narrative started forming after October the 7th, and there, sorry, after 9-11. And therefore, when October the 7th came, the world reacted differently to terrorism. Terrorists became labeled as freedom fighters. Mass rape and the murder of women became justified as resistance legitimate resistance to an occupation. Theologically motivated terrorism has become righteous anger. So what happened between 9-11 and October the 7th? What accounts for this completely radical shift in the way that society views Islamist terrorism and its victims? Obviously, some people would argue that there's a double standard against Israel, and it's true. But I would also like to point out the very relevant fact that after 9-11, there was a strategic and coordinated campaign to silence and intimidate, to slander, shame, and even sue anyone who was brave enough to speak about the threat of Islamist terrorism, and especially the fact that it's a threat shared both by the West and the Jewish state. The, what I called Islamophobia mania industry, successfully muddled the narrative and confused the public into thinking that they should be ashamed for talking about real issues of national security. We were told it's politically incorrect 
to be calling out the radicalization happening within our borders. The Islamophobia mania industry even succeeded in causing our Department of Education, the Department of Justice, and the FBI to turn a blind eye to the fact that Qatar has spent over $1 billion a year for the last 10 years funding anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism on our college campuses. When I was 26 years old, I traveled to Janin, Ramallah, Tulkam, and Nabilis to produce what became an award-winning documentary film called The Making of a Martyr. At great personal risk, I interviewed leaders of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Al-Aqsa Mar Brigades, and Fatah. I went into their schools. I went into UNRWA schools, the United Nations Relief, United Nations, uh, you un why am I going by? You UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency. I went into UNRWA schools over 10 years ago, together with the Center for Near East Policy Research, David Bedeen, and we conclusively proved how the Palestinians were indoctrinating and recruiting innocent Muslim children for suicide homicide attacks, how UNRWA was inviting Al Kutla Al Islamiya, which is Hamas's youth wing, directly into the schools to recruit from the schools, how they were using the schools as basis for rocket launching attacks and to hide their rocket launchers. And it's bizarre to me that if I knew this, how is it that the head of UNRWA, the head of UNRWA went on TV just a couple days ago and said, well, we didn't know this was happening. How is it that I knew it was happening and he didn't? Now, my documentary was released and we were actually given an award for best documentary film by the United Nations uh, Documentary Film Festival, which was ironic for all the reasons that I just listed. And I traveled the world for about a year and a half going to different film festivals. And I was called anti-Muslim. I was called an Islamophobe. And I always thought that if risking your life to shed light on the fact that Muslim children are innocent, and they don't deserve to be murdered as child soldiers. They don't to be deserve to be used as, as human shields. If that's anti-Muslim, what then is pro-Muslim? And isn't that the bigotry of low expectations? Now, October the 7th obviously was a watershed moment for us and, and for the world. And what I want to say, the rabbi asked me before, what is your goal today in your speech? And my goal is to make sure that every single person walks out of this room and does not feel or no longer feels intimidated to talk about the threats we face, not just in the Jewish state, but in the West. Because like I said, they are shared threats. The haters have come out of their holes. There is no more pretending that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. There's no more pretending that Students for Justice in Palestine is some sort of benign, student-led, grassroots movement. There's no more pretending that the pro-Palestinian movement is a movement for self-sovereignty. It is not. There is no such thing as a Palestinian democracy movement or a Palestinian peace movement. It is pro-Hamas. There's no more pretending that progressive ideology is liberal. It is not. It is pro-terror. And there's no more pretending in this farce of a two-state solution. Because creating a Palestinian Islamic state, creating an Islamist state in a sea of failed Islamic dictatorships is not a solution to anything. And a state should not, certainly should not be a reward for terror. So if there's a silver lining to all of this, it is that whereas before October the 7th, the Jewish community in the diaspora was divided on political partisan lines or on you know, pro-occupation, anti-occupation, we are no longer divided. We are united. And whereas the Jewish community in Israel 
which I've had the fortune to be living in after making Aliyah three years ago, was horrifically divided. Pro-reform, anti-reform. This is no longer the case. The Israelis are united. And the Jewish people are strong when we are united. And make no mistake, the Jewish people will win this battle. Because we, we are the eternal people. And we have outlived all of our enemies throughout history. The question is not whether we're going to win, but what price are we going to have to pay? Because the more we shed this political correctness, the more we shed the ideologies and the policies that do not serve us, the less likely it is that we will have to pay with more innocent Jewish lives for our freedom. A enormous strategic mistake that we made recently, that the Israeli government made, was sending its attorneys and accepting jurisdiction of the Kangaroo International Court of Justice. We had no legal obligation to be here. What kind of message do we send the world, not just when we send Tal Becker for his five minutes of fame as he appears before these judges? Who is the world to judge the Jewish people when they stood by and did nothing centuries after centuries of genocide? But what kind of message do we send the world when we are arresting Jewish people praying on the Temple Mount, exercising their religious freedom? What kind of message do we send the world when we demolish the home of IDF soldiers in Judea and Samaria while they were fighting in Gaza when only their wives and children were there? What kind of message did we send the world when we as Jews signed up for the progressive woke agenda and encouraged people to march behind anti-Semites like Linda Sarsour and Tamika Mallory in the so-called Me Too movement. And that is why I am really so happy to be here today with this particular community because this is not a community that kowtows to political correctness and it is not a community that's afraid to call out the threat of radical Islam. Now we hear a lot today about rising anti-Semitism, and I actually like to call it Jew hatred, because not many people know the origin of the term anti-Semitism. It is a term that was invented by German eugenicists. It's not a slander. They were proud of it. It was a, a pseudo-intellectual way of justifying while the white people were superior to the Semitic people, and it doesn't just apply to Jews, by the way. So what is the solution to Jew hatred? Can we end Jew hatred in our lifetime? What does it mean to end Jew hatred? Well, hatred, obviously, is an emotion. It's something that we're born with. And Jew hatred, as the rabbi said, is irrational. But Jew hatred is taught. Nobody is born with Jew hatred in their hearts. And while Black Lives Matter did not get rid of anti-black racism and the new women's movement did not get rid of male misogyny, what they have done is they have made it socially unacceptable to engage in certain behavior. So ending Jew hatred means that anti-Semitism becomes socially acceptable once again. It means that people who are engaged in anti-Semitism are shunned, they're deplatformed, they're sued, they're punished, and they're recognized as incorrect. But how do we do this? Jew hatred has come and gone in ebbs and flows throughout history, and now we know it's rising. How do we push Jew hatred down again, so it becomes socially unacceptable, at least in our country. And the answer is simple. 
by imposing real consequences for the bad behavior that we do not want to see. For too long, the Islamophobia industry created a situation where Jew hatred has gone unpunished. Professors on, camp on campuses who target their students for being Jewish have felt no consequences. They were legally immune. Student organizations who discriminated and targeted Jewish students and contributed to a hostile environment remained completely undeterred. The billions of dollars coming from Qatar to the United States to radicalize our population is flowing without any obstacle whatsoever. Well, I'm here to tell you that this will no longer be the case. As the founder and executive director of the Lawfare Project, we have put together a war room comprised of over 600 lawyers and three dozen major international law firms. And we are engaged in what I like to call impact litigation. Now, Jews have always been at the forefront of civil rights movements. We were at the front marching for black rights. We were marching for women's rights. We founded the ACLU. We founded the NAACP. Every minority rights uh, group has their own legal fund. Some have more students. There's Palestine Legal, the National Lawyers Guild, the Muslim Legal Fund for America, the Council on American Islamic Relations. But up until seven years ago, the Jewish community had not one public interest law firm, not one Jewish civil rights litigation fund to engage in strategic litigation to uphold our civil rights. We are the oldest, most persecuted minority community in human history. This is the age of minority rights movements, right? If you think about it, every single right that we enjoy is a product of a seminal civil rights case. Roe v. Wade, which was recently partially overturned, women's rights to choose, Brown v. Board of Education, one student got rid of segregation in America. The Asian community just sued Harvard and overturned affirmative action. Name me one seminal civil rights case that the Jewish community has brought before the Supreme Court. There's none. In the past seven years, we have brought over 137 cases on behalf of Jewish communities in 17 jurisdictions around the world. And I'm going to tell you now only about the most recent cases. And I urge you to go to our website, thelawfareproject.org, click on the Cases tab, and read them. Because it is so empowering to see how case by case, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, we are changing the fabric of American society. In 2000... <laughs> In 2019, we sued and settled with San Francisco State University. SFSU used to be ground zero for anti-Israel activity. In fact, Yasser Arafat himself flew from Egypt. Yasser Arafat was an Egyptian. He's not a Palestinian. There's no such thing as a Palestinian, exclusively Muslim national identity. It is a fiction. Yasser Arafat flew from Egypt to San Francisco, went to SFSU, and established GUPS, the General Union of Palestinian Students, which then became SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. Now, SFSU had Hillel, the only, has Hillel, the only Jewish student group on campus, also not a political group. Every year, the school allows all of its student groups to table at a, at a student fair, where student groups can go set up a table and recruit other students to join their student group. Hillel was the only student group that was denied the ability to table. Why? Because they said it was a Zionist-free zone. 
Also at the same school, when the Hillel students invited then mayor of Jerusalem near Barkat to speak, the students were threatened so violently that they were escorted out of the room under police protection. And when the police had asked the, had asked the school administrators to remove the protesters, the administrator said, no, no, no. They gave them a stand down order. They wanted to see what would happen. They wanted potentially for violence to ensue. So we sued the school on behalf of the Jewish students there. And what was remarkable to me is that the school did not deny the fact that they denied Hillel the ability to table. It was not a fact at issue in the case. They said, yes, we did not allow Hillel to table, but not because they're Jewish. We don't have any problems with Jews, but because they're Zionists. And Zionism is a political point of view, and we are allowed to discriminate against you because your political point of view, points of view. The California anti-discrimination law prevents discrimination based on race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, color of your skin, and so forth. It doesn't prevent us from discriminating against you because of your politics. So they stood by what they did, which was alarming to me. And so we said to them, well, number one, who are you to define what Zionism is for my clients? Zionism is an integral part of their cultural, religious, and ethnic identity. But okay, let's say, for argument's sake, that Zionism is only a political point of view. Only Jewish students are given a political litmus test as a condition precedent to participating. You don't go to the Chinese Student Association and say, what's your position on COVID? Unless you're a good Chinese student, you can't participate. You don't go to the Muslim Student Association and ask them, well, what's your position on Iranian nuclear disarmament? Unless you're a good Muslim or an anti-Iranian Muslim, you can't, you can't participate. Only the Jewish students are being given a political litmus test in order to participate, and that is de facto discrimination. You are treating the Jewish students differently than you're treating others. Day one in court, we settled the case. And what we got in that settlement agreement was so significant. Obviously, they had to pay uh, fees. They had to, we didn't trust the administration, so they had to hire a third party uh, company, an auditing company that would hear any complaints of, of discrimination. But most importantly, we, because we sued actually the California State University system, which is the umbrella system. And this is the power of impact litigation. Yes, I have my particular client, our plaintiff, with their particular set of facts. But when you use the courts, you set a precedent in that jurisdiction that not only benefits the Jewish community, but benefits all minority communities. So our precedent, our settlement agreement, was with the California State University system. And for the first time in American history, we got a state university system to recognize and to change their policy that now reads, quote, we recognize that for Jewish students, for some Jewish students, Zionism is an integral part of their Jewish identity. Therefore, anti-Zionist discrimination is not a political issue. It's a civil rights issue. And that has made an enormous difference on that campus. When the National Lawyers Guild, the oldest uh, lawyers guild in the country, with dozens of chapters and thousands of members, decided to uh, pass a BDS resolution, we took note. My client incorporated a company in Judea Samaria called Bibliotechnica and attempted to buy an ad in the annual journal for the National Lawyers Guild uh, fundraising dinner. He attempted to buy a half page ad, said something like, Congratulations, National's Lawyers, National Lawyers Guild, for all your work. Love, Bibliotechnical, comma, Judea, comma, Israel. Well, we couldn't believe it when just a couple days later we received an email in writing saying, I'm sorry, we've returned your money. We cannot accept your ad. 
we don't do business with Israelis. That's what they said in the email. How stupid. <laughs> well, we sued them on behalf of our client. Day one in court, we settled the case. What we were able to accomplish is we reversed their BDS resolution. We forced the National Lawyers Guild Board to issue a new resolution declaring that they are against national origin discrimination because that's what BDS is. We always repeat this acronym. I bet you if you walked on you know, Times Square and took a survey of 100 people and asked them what is BDS, they wouldn't know what the acronym stands for. We should call it what it is, unlawful discrimination, unlawful commercial discrimination. It is illegal in most states to have a business and put a sign up that says, no blacks allowed, or you know, have a bar and say, no Chinese allowed. It is similarly, likewise, illegal to have a business and say, we don't do business with Israelis. We sued National Lawyers Guild, we reversed their uh, discriminatory policy and we forced them to do business with their client. They said, oh no, no, we'll, we'll carry the ad for free. I said, no, 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 we'll pay for it. And this time we're getting a full page ad. And we forced them not only to do business, but we also forced them to send out an email to all of their chapters saying that if you engage in unlawful commercial discrimination, you will lose the ability to use the National Lawyers Guild and you can no longer be a part of it. Kuwait Airways Corporation is the airline of the state of Kuwait. Now, Kuwait Airways at one time, or still today actually, refuses to fly Israeli passengers. So we sent our client, an Israeli, to the airport and filmed him attempting to buy a ticket from Kuwait Airways. He was obviously denied. We sued Kuwait Airlines Corporation in New York. We sued them in a couple uh, European destinations where they were flying. And to make a long story short, we succeeded in shutting down all of their inter-European flight paths, as well as their JFK to London route for unlawful discrimination, because they would rather lose millions and millions of dollars than fly Israelis. Now, I want to talk about just two cases. There are so many cases and so many stories I can tell you that are so empowering but I know that we don't have a lot of time. I know everyone's time here is valuable, but there's just two more cases I wanna talk about. And those are the two cases that I just filed over the past couple weeks after October the 7th. We filed a lawsuit against Carnegie Mellon University. Now, when you're involved in litigation, you gotta get the facts right, so get them here. Carnegie Mellon University is the third largest recipient of money from Qatar. CMU has received what we know, $666 million from Qatar. They have a campus in Qatar. And these outsized donations have no doubt contributed to the abusive, pervasive, systemic, and cruel campaign of Jew hatred happening at that university, targeting their Jewish students. We are very proud to represent Yael, a Jewish American of Israeli descent who was retaliated against, she was excluded, she was shut out from academic opportunities, she was denied and excused absence to attend a memorial ceremony for the Tree of Life victims when they allow students to go to BLM protests, other types of protests. When she was, uh, she was in the School of Architecture, and when she was told, along with her other students, to do a project, a model, distinguishing between public and private spaces, she decided to do an air roof, which I'm sure many of you know, is the distinction in the Jewish religion between a public and a private place for the purposes of the laws of caring during Shabbat. 
The teacher walked up to her, looked at her project, and said to her, is that a project about the illegal wall that Israel is building to keep the Palestinians out? And she said, no, it's not. It's an Arab. And she explained it. And, the t and then the teacher goes, technically the studio coordinator said, why don't you do a project on what Jews make themselves, what Jews do to make themselves so hated? When she complained and she went to her DEI, filed diversity, equity, inclusion department, filed numerous complaints. They did absolutely nothing. In fact, they discouraged her from filing an official complaint. She told them she felt unsafe. She was then given a near failing grade and she was told by her professor to quote, stop acting like a victim. We can't fight your battles for you. So we sued Carnegie Mellon University. We sued them for monetary damages, for the loss of educational opportunities, for her tuition, for the cost of medical care. But more importantly, our hope, and I know that our lawsuit is going to cause CMU to revise their anti-discrimination and training policies. They're going to be forced to protect their Jewish students. We're going to expose through the lawsuit the toxic undercurrent of anti-Semitism that is corroding academia. And we're going to, for the first time, shed light because there lacks transparency on the role that foreign funding plays in the rise of Jew hatred in America. And the last lawsuit that I want to tell you about is the one we just filed three days ago against Columbia University. Our student, Mackenzie Forrest, is a student at Columbia University School of Social Work. When she was asked for, for a religious accommodation because they have classes on Shabbat, she was told to go to her rabbi and get him to exempt her from the laws of Shabbat. <laughs> she reported the anti-Semitic behavior that was happening at Columbia University, and I just want to mention what's happened there. At Columbia University, pro-Hamas moms have been running rampant on campus. They have actually blocked access to classrooms. They've been chanting genocidal chants, calling for the elimination, not just of the Jewish state, but of the Jewish people. Jewish students have been both verbally and physically attacked. One Jewish student was attacked and had his hand broken. The free speech rights of the Jewish students on campus are routinely violated, and I'm sure some of you saw the Instagram video that went viral, the five minute video of Professor Shai Davidai who was standing at the Columbia Quad saying, I cannot guarantee that your children will be safe on this campus. Well, guess what? Neither can the school. Because when the mother of Mackenzie Forrest called up Columbia University and said, my, my child feels unsafe on this campus, the school admitted that they could not keep her physically safe. And yet when she asked for an accommodation to take her classes over Zoom, she was denied. They said, no, you have to come into school, even though students are routinely granted the ability to take classes on Zoom, especially after COVID. So we are suing Columbia University for both injunctive relief, remedial relief, monetary damages, and we will no doubt cure these campuses one by one, because in the next few weeks, in the next few weeks, we will be launching a series of hard-hitting, groundbreaking lawsuits against universities across the United States, and we need your support. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and I appreciate everybody's time and their patience today, but this is so important, and this is why I include it. You'll see also on the seats, everyone has a postcard about the End Jew Hatred Movement. The End Jew Hatred Movement was formed three years ago 
And the reason why it was, it was formed um, is because when I was pregnant uh, three and a half years ago with my third child, Zachary, and it was in the middle of COVID, I was living in Brooklyn, in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and I could not walk out of my house because I was white passing, I was pregnant, and because Black Lives Matter was letting cop cars on fire down the street from me, and threatening violence, looting up and down Madison Avenue. And yet, all of my friends were posting and hashtagging Black Lives Matter and blacking out their Instagrams and taking selfies with their fist in the air and virtue signaling and all that kind of stuff that they're doing. And I thought, what is going on here? I made a list. Who was posting in support of Black Lives Matter? Just so happened, about three and a half months later, Israel was under attack. There was a barrage of rockets. I called each one up and I said, I noticed that you posted Black Lives Matter. Can you please post something? And most of these friends are Jewish, by the way. Can you please post something in support of Israel? And all of them said, well, I don't know. It's political. I might get you know, retaliated against. I can't do it. And I thought to myself, this, this age-old question, why does Israel have such bad PR? Why have we not been able to crack that? And like I said, this is the age of minority rights movements. It's not the same to be a woman in the workforce as it was five years ago. It's not the same to be black as it was 10 years ago. As the oldest, most persecuted minority community in human history, why have we not achieved parity? Why is it still okay to engage in anti-Jewish behavior? And I commissioned a study. And the study did a deep dive into the strategies, the tactics, the language, the messaging, the organization of the civil rights movement of the 50s, the black civil rights movement of the 50s, the 60s, the Black Lives Matter, the new women's movement, the end Asian hate movement, and the LGBTQIA plus movement. And what I found was so shocking and yet so obvious that I decided, I'm gonna summarize it for you very briefly, I promise, to write a book about it. And the book you can see is in one of the uh, postcards, it's called End Jew Hatred, a practical guide um, for, for mobilizing, I think is what I called it. Now, what did we learn? And I will end with this, okay? What did we learn in our study? Number one thing that we learned is that there has never been a Jewish civil rights movement in America, never. There was the Zionist movement that was started by Theodore Herzl 125 years ago, but it was about getting Jews out of you know, Russia and out of the places that they're persecuted and establishing sovereignty in our homeland where we are supposed to be able to live freely, free of persecution. There was the Soviet Jewry movement, which lasted a very hot minute, that got hundreds of thousands of people on the street and succeeded against the Soviet Union and succeeded in getting Jews again out of where they were discriminated against and putting them in Canada, the United States, and Israel. But there's never been a Jewish civil rights movement in America that centers on the Jewish people having equal rights and equal protection here. Not having to leave to go somewhere else, but to be treated equally here. The second thing that we learned was that successful civil rights movements, everything is in the name. Black Lives Matter. If you're against Black Lives Matter and you're a racist, no matter the looting and the rioting and there's this cognitive dissonance that happens, you're a racist if you don't support BLM. Or if you're against women's rights, you're a misogynist. Now the way that we describe ourselves is as pro-Israel. If you are a Jewish student and you want to be an advocate, you're told you have to be pro-Israel. You're given a pamphlet by some of these wonderful groups that I support and I'm not criticizing, like Stand With Us or Camera on Campus, and you're told you have to memorize, memorize a 15-page pamphlet, you have to know international law, foreign policy, national security, and you have to go into the arena on the defense and defend a foreign country thousands of miles away that you Maybe you have never visited, you certainly have no control over the policies there. 
Civil rights movements speak the language of civil rights. They talk about oppression, systemic racism, bigotry, and they're concentrated on what's happening here and now. They're concentrated on your neighbor, your best friend, your teacher, and their personal experiences. We have never framed our issue as a civil rights issue. And that's obviously, I think, what I do with the litigation. Now, the more we respond to, to, to anti-Jewish discrimination with pro-Israel advocacy, the more we give them an affirmative defense to discriminate against us. So, for example, if I hate China because of the way they handled COVID, I can't turn around to a Chinese American student, spit on him, and call him a dirty COVID spreader. That would be disgusting, and that would be wrong, and that would be condemned. But if you are my client, Jonathan Carton, at Columbia University, and you're walking across the quad, it's perfectly acceptable to spit on him and call him a dirty Zionist baby killer because you're protesting Israeli policy. And we cannot respond to that with pro-Israel advocacy because it feeds into that narrative that it's okay to project your hatred of a foreign country on someone because of how they look or where they're born or what their religion is. And the last two things we learned about what successful minority rights movements do is number one, how they're organized. They're organized on the grassroots level and they're focused locally. The Black Lives Matter movement has spent the last 13 years going into prisons, going into local communities, training, rising up new leaders, giving micro grants, creating chapters, and teaching them how to mobilize locally. Now there's nothing that I or you or anyone in this room, except probably the rabbi, can do about Rashida Tlaib and do about the squad. But there's certainly something that we can do about a local bodega owner that puts a sign out that says, no Zionists allowed. We have to be able to organize on a grassroots level. It used to be, for example, that if you wanted to fight anti-Semitism, you're told you have to write a check to Simon Wiesenthal Center and we'll take care of it for you. That's no longer the case. Every single person in this room has to mobilize just as we've been mobilizing after October the 7th and take it upon themselves and think, what can I do? What connections can I use? What power do I have personally to engage and organize on a local level, to engage in protests and direct actions that the fourth thing we learned is ensure consequences for bad behavior. Every single one of these movements zeroes in on a target, like Harvey Weinstein, who, who is by no means the only male misogynist in the world, but they targeted it on him and they didn't let go and for a year and a half, they took him down. And now nobody wants to be like Harvey Weinstein. And so that is what we do with a combination of impact litigation, with a combination of impact litigation plus grassroots advocacy. We ensure through the courts and on the streets that there will be consequences for Jew hatred. And after I founded the Jew Hatred Movement, and I'll conclude with this, we have succeeded in mobilizing thousands and thousands of activists across both the United States and Canada. So that when an employees, when the employees of a bakery in New York, if you recall, walked out on their employer because he was pro-Israel, the Andrew Hatred movement the same day in less than 24 hours mobilized hundreds of people to show up at that bakery and there were lines around the block to patronize that restaurant. When a law school student posted pro-Hamas propaganda, the Andrew Hatred movement mobilized and got her job offer rescinded by the law firm. And when the students and parents at Michigan University called us, we were able to mobilize together with our partners 1,500 people 
to protest outside the dean's office and for the first time in American college history, the, uh, the university disallowed the students to vote on BDS. Killed the vote, period. That's the power of Jewish unity and grassroots mobilization. Now this mobilization was not possible pre-October the 7th, but because we've woken up to this, I really encourage everyone to join the movement we will win the battle, both in Israel and in the United States, because the truth is on our side, the law is on our side, history is on our side, and Hashem is on our side.